Yeah, so I think I'm just going to start off. Thank you for coming to my presentation. I'm not sure. These are probably the true geeks in the room. They prefer the nerd. I prefer geek. Nerd has some other implications. Well, because if you say geek, I always reference to like Geek Squad, and they don't do that much shopping, bro. All right. All right, well, this is not good. Uh, I had problems with this. I had to futz with it for a moment. Let's see if I can. So this is the great thing about Docker: is you let the test do your pre futzing, and then um, just take advantage. Right after the right in the Docker. You're gonna have to write that into my process: pre futzing. And then you're just gonna get this one. Okay. Yay. Yay. There we go. Go for it. All right, let's just hand over the presentation to the All right, who am I? Uh, I'm just some guy. I've been around for a long time. Uh, when I grew up here, it's gray. But I'm a gray beard. I wrote a book back in the day called Project Development where I basically went through Drupal because there was no documentation. And I read the code and I wrote what the book that I wish I would have had when I started. I did that a couple of times. There's not going to be a book for Drupal 8. We're going to do a Drupal 8 book. And it's, uh, it's not going to happen. But I'm still there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm also, I have another book uh, called Sensing Monitoring Metrics that I'm hoping to finish at some point. It's out on Lean Pub, and um, I'm about 85% done with it. Okay, yes, back in the day. Uh, I'm a core developer from back in the day. This is me presenting um, a problem where we had some double serialization with no save and you know, submitting a patch and so forth. And, and even back then, uh, the going was tough. <laughs> so that was very exciting to everybody. Yeah, yeah. Okay, to the presentation. Uh, what I'd like to do today is talk about OpenShift. Um, I'm going to talk about the big paradigm shift that's going on right now that Tess alluded to earlier with all the Docker stuff that's coming along, and the cloud stuff, and it's a whole new world out there from what things used to be like. Talk about how this might be useful to you, and what are the steps that you could take to be going in the right direction, riding the right horse so that five, ten years from now uh, you'll have the right set of skills and you'll still be uh, surviving and not have some dinosaur that's trying to run something on a hardware or data center somewhere. Okay, I'm starting off with a little rant. So, Red Hat, if you are listening to this presentation on the internet, this is for you. I went down to DrupalCon, uh, that's DrupalCon, not DrupalCon, uh, New Orleans, and I talked to vendors about OpenShift because OpenShift is really the cat's pajamas. It is, it is amazing software. And I talk to these vendors that are writing these Git workflow, does something in and it puts it on your server kind of thing, and they're all excited. And nobody even knew what OpenShift was. And why is that? Because OpenShift's been around for a long, long time. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because nobody knows what OpenShift means. Okay? Just recently at the Red Hat Summit, they finally renamed OpenShift on-premise to Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform. Look, Container Platform. That's what it is. It's a container management platform. So why not say that? Why they only did it for their dedicated, or not even dedicated, no, no, because that's in the cloud. That's managed by Red Hat. It's not on-premise. And then they've got OpenShift on. I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. It's Red Hat Container Platform. That's what it is, and that's what it should be called. The other products, Red Hat Gluster Storage. What's that? We know what that is. Uh, OpenShift, is that OpenStack? 
No, they are completely different technologies that do completely different things, even though you can run OpenShift on OpenStack. Okay, Frank right over. Uh, next is complicated. It's just complicated. And I'm glad that we had a whole presentation in front of this presentation talking about Docker, because that's kind of a prerequisite for understanding what's going on here. Even so, I'm going to go on a little bit about what are containers and, and where we come from and stuff like that. So let's start with Docker. Uh, again, I'm, I'm dating myself, but my first public web server that I ran uh, was on this hardware here. This is a Macintosh <laughs> SD30. Uh, it was a great program back then called WebStar. It, uh, it did things right. <coughs> uh, but the problem was, if the SE decided to lock up or somebody needed it for something else, and I decided to quit <coughs> WebStar, my website was off. Now, a little bit later, I moved on to an alpha server, which is a Unix-based system. And that was like the fifth of the community. And uh, it's been Unix for me ever since. But even so, you can still have this kind of a problem when your system's dead. And that's because the old school method is you've got hardware, you've got your kernel, and you run your program on OK. That's the way it was. I mean, with the exception of mainframes, which had were way, way advanced and doing stuff back then, the world only reinvented now. Um, this is what you did. <coughs> then along came a concept called the virtual machine. And the virtual machine changed the landscape completely. If you didn't get on board with virtual machines, if you were somebody who said, poo poo, virtual machines are too slow, too hard to manage, they give me no benefit, uh, they're just more complicated, I'm doing fine with my rack of servers here in the data center, uh, that's fine. There's not too many of those people around anymore. So with the virtual machine, you basically uh, have a very small kernel called hypervisor on top of your hardware. And then you have a set of fake hardware, which is really nice. Because, you know, we used to have a whole bunch of different kinds of Ethernet cards. And you needed drivers for those Ethernet cards that maybe didn't come in the kernel. And there was a whole problem that we don't deal with anymore. Uh, the fake hardware was all consistent. You can still add virtual hardware to this, but pretty much we don't think about this stuff anymore. Not unless you're really trying to optimize your stack or you're really a, you know, kind of a hardware buff. It's a problem that's gone away. We don't even think about it. Okay, we still have the problem, right? If the hardware goes away, everything goes away. So what's the solution to that? Well, the solution to that is to have more than one piece of hardware. And what you do is you cluster them together. And you've got kernels running on multiple pieces of hardware. Got them all networked together. All of a sudden, uh, the intern walking through the data center trips with the coffee, and uh, you lose your hardware. Easy enough, right? You've got redundancy. You just move your program over here and keep running. How can you do that? Because you have a virtual machine. You can stop it in time. You can migrate from one machine to another, and you're actually migrating first the static parts, you know, then the volatile memory, and then finally take a quick snapshot of the stuff that's changing really fast. You just move that over, kill this, bring this up over here. It's, it's seamless. You've got a couple of seconds of downtime at, at the most. Okay, this is all, again, not something that we're really worrying about anymore. If you're on the bandwagon, we're going to the cloud, and the cloud makes all of this layer opaque. You, you don't worry about this. Your program just keeps running. Now, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the Docker container. Docker container is really the same thing again. It's just a program, it's just a process running on your kernel. So let's compare the two. We've got the big stack here. We've got the little stack over here. 
Now, start up the program. On the virtual machine, you've got to boot your kernel on your fake hardware, bring up your OS, boot it, okay, get the networking up, not bring up shares, whatever, and now you can start the process. Okay, on Docker, you just start the process. Can it comes up? Everything's there. No false loss. It's quick. And one of the little gotchas as to why it's really, really quick is that, and I didn't hear this word in, in, in Tesla's presentation, but I think it's very important, is the word immutable. Why is Docker so awesome? Because containers are immutable. Or they should be. You can change them, but those changes aren't going to last. So you might as well just consider that your Docker container is the way it's going to be forever, which isn't very long in Docker land because you're supposed to be able to just throw out containers and bring up new ones instantly. In fact, Google does it many times per second. So here's our comparison chart. Virtual machine, heavyweight, and really, I mean, I run a lot of virtual machines. I love the virtual machines. I'm really being taken, kicking, and screaming into this new paradigm because virtual machine management is mature. We're at the same place that we were years ago when you had the hardware. <clears throat> you know, you've got a redundant array of expensive disk. You can lose a disk, no problem. You gotta deal with that. You've even got hot spare memory. So it's hard to leave that world of virtual machines that are nice and mature and the tools are all there and jump into this Docker thing that seems to be, I mean, what, what was it last week? Last week was the first real release for Mac and Windows and Docker. This is crazy, crazy fast moving stuff. All right, virtual machines, build it once, uh, keep it remote. Is it true again, there's, a, there's another paradigm shift happening with just machine management, configuration management. You keep the Ansible scripts around. It builds the machine. All right, what kind of containers do we need for our kind of work? Uh, obviously, a web server of some kind. Uh, if you're going to do it right, you probably need a reverse proxy, even in some sort of database container. Uh, some sort of web server PHP thing, you can put them together, you can have two different containers if you want. Uh, some sort of caching mechanism, Red Cache, Redis, your own custom C code, whatever you want. Uh, and we can manage these things, right? Containers, are, you just spin them up, you get them from Docker Hub, you maybe modify the Docker file, and then uh, you just have to type some commands on the command line, like this here, Docker exec, um, you know, and then maybe that one, or, you know, a couple of these per container, you know, to get some spe specific options in. Hmm. Is this look familiar? Back in the day, back when you started, right, you're like, hey, I can make an HTML page. I can type in head. I can type in bottom. I can type in title. And if I want to change it, I'll go change that file. And then one day, the light bulb went on. And you're like, there's a thing called PHP. I could just write some code that does that for me. And it was like this big thing. And then you're like, well, I'll make a website. And now I need a news page. And I need to use your login page. Because that's kind of cool because I can write code that will actually change the index PHP. Except for I should probably stop repeating myself with the database connection in every file and move that out into a library and just include that. And, you know, uh, we're going to need some sort of footer that's consistent except for on this one page. And, uh, <laughs> Maybe we've all done this, I certainly have. You've written your own CMS. And then all of a sudden, you start looking around and you realize, gee, other people have written CMSs. And guess what? 
with way better than you are. But people seem smarter too. I mean, more of them working together, right? And in fact, they have standards for things and they have terminology for stuff. And for me, that's when I came on board Drupal. We had a fairly nice Ruby-based CNS go. Um, but Drupal did a lot of what we were doing and that was already there. And it was going forward without me. Like people were just improving it without any input on my part. Let's jump on board that ship. Okay, I'm obviously saying this to make an analogy, right? So that's where we are with Docker. The running Docker on the command line. The downloading a Docker file and then editing it and then pushing it back up to Docker. The like managing my repo of Docker things that are coming down. Maybe somebody has thought about this. Maybe somebody's been working on this for years. And maybe there are actually best practices in these areas. And if people just knew that it was called OpenShift, I think we'd get a lot further a lot faster. <laughs> okay. So next layer above Docker containers. Um, we need some way of managing Docker, Docker containers. Or what it would call the business orchestrating. We need to orchestrate our containers. Because we want this container, this container, this container, but we want this container to come up before this container. We want these two to share a volume. We want this port to be able to talk to that port. We need something that does that. And Fortunately, there's a very large company that's been using these things for over 10 years. And they have something uh, that they call the board. This is Google that I'm talking about, right? They have a lot of experience in running containers. And at some point, they said, maybe we should take all those lessons and kind of do a reboot and open source something. Kubernetes is the name of the project. Comes from the Greek, meaning pilot or helmsman as of a ship. And you basically tell Kubernetes what you want, and it makes it so. I want a set of five Apache containers. In fact, that's not even what you say to Kubernetes. What you say to Kubernetes is there will be five Apache containers. <laughs> And that's exactly the way Kubernetes thinks. And it looks out there and says, one, two, three, four. Oh, I must spin up another container for there to be one. And so all that is taken care of by Kubernetes. It's a very mature project. Moving fast, but uh, there's a wonderful presentation online by one of the folks at Google. It goes into a lot of detail about how Kubernetes works. I would recommend if you're getting into OpenShift that you go watch that presentation, read the Kubernetes docs, because really uh, OpenShift lets Kubernetes handle all that stuff because it's really good. So what you get is instead of that jumble of containers, you get your containers all nicely organized. So Kubernetes thinks about containers in groups. And these groups are called pods. A pod is just a set of containers. What's nifty about this is that these pods contain containers that can just talk to each other over IP. They both think that they're on local host. So all the networking is taken care of. Now, if you took a couple of those pods and you load them, you would get something called a service. What if load balancing was taken care of for free? Like if you just click the button and said, I want three of these Apaches as a service, make it so. That's what OpenShift does. It puts a load balancer in front of it and it configures the load balancer. And you don't have to do anything. Literally, you click a button or you type in commands, I want so many others. 
Everything in the new paradigm is low balanced. The front end is an HA low balanced. Inside, every service you have should be redundant, highly available, low balanced. You want absolutely nothing to go down. Because it will go down, right? If, if you've got anything with Amazon and cloud services, you're not guaranteed that things are going to stay up. So you need to rethink the way you're architecting things. So this is what's really happening. <clears throat> Inside OpenShift, you're going to have a proxy that you don't have to really think about, right? It manages the proxy for you. And then you're going to define, you're going to tell it that there's a, a certain route from this service. So map .dub example .com through to this service, which is going to be a collection of groups running, highly available. Now this service is going to need some other supplementary services. Right? It's going to have to have a database service of some kind probably a caching service. And, you know, <clears throat> I've got my hardware stack over at Iowa State, the machine. And I've got a master database, I've got some secondary databases. Those are big, beefy boxes. And I don't really care that much, but there's a lot of queries going those databases because I know they're big and strong. In the new architecture, we have to think about that. We have to cache everything we can. Why? Because it's very close. And you want to minimize the traffic that's going from one place or out of this cluster. So when we were thinking about this originally, I was like, well, we have these big beefy database boxes right here at the university. We could just take our OpenShift cluster in Amazon, point it to this database. It's big, strong, fast. Well, there are some costs associated with having traffic coming outside of Amazon versus inside of Amazon. So now you've got to start thinking, you know, put your business hat on. Like, well, te technologically this is going to be better, but not financially. And that's probably better anyway. I mean, I'm just kind of being lazy about the database duty work. Really, if I were to make my ultimate stack, it would certainly have caching and reverse proxy or something. So maybe that's what's missing here is an Nginx or a, you know, some sort of front end. Just play with this thing. Okay, now you've got a problem. If everything is ephemeral, everything goes away, where do you put your data? Where does it live? Where is it going to be persistent? So you put it in persistent storage. So OpenShift has a concept of persistent storage, and when you define uh, a build, you can ask for a certain amount uh, from, the, from the pool and it will be allocated to you. Now, one of the things that OpenShift does is it takes security very seriously. Now, that is really, I'm just going to be honest, it's not the strong suit of Docker. Most people making Docker containers. Are running stuff as root because heck, you're inside of a container. If you're root inside of a container, what is that? Even don't worry about it. OpenShift is worried about. It. So there's some extra steps when you're making a container. You want to make sure that MariaDB process is running as MariaDB process correct UID, not as root. Um, so there's some additional security mechanisms there. Okay. So I am running OpenShift. Uh, okay, so the upstream project, if you know anything about Red Hat, uh, every project, everything they have has an upstream that's open source. So the upstream from OpenShift is called OpenShift Origin, and it's completely open source. You can go download it. And one of the things they have is in uh, all in one virtual machine. They also have a Docker image if you want to run it that way. Uh, and you can just kind of experiment with, with it on your own laptop. So that's what I'm going to try and do here. There's a couple parts to this. But the main part that's interesting 
is the user interface. You can see I've got a list of projects here. Now projects are kind of an uh, encapsulation. So I can make a project and I can give you and you and you access to it, make another project, you and you and you. Right? You're going to need that. It's kind of like you could run a website but not have Drupal's roles. You could do it, it would be a real pain. It's nice to have those roles defined. This is one of the things that you just get is the ability to define projects. So I've got, um, first, first of all, our um, version of Drupal at Iowa State is called Luggage. Uh, basically, it's Drupal, Drupal 7, plus features, plus modules and dependencies, and our own little, you know, whatever, however we've tweaked it, our own theme, and so forth. And so that's what Luggage means here. So I've got two projects. One is a persistent MySQL here. And you can see I'm using CentOS, MySQL 5.6. And I'm running one pod. I could increase the number of pods by just clicking this button here. Um, you can see some definitions on the right-hand side. What's a pod, what's a service, and so forth. You can see that there's a way to browse things here. We talked about pods. We talked a little bit about routes and services and storage. There's also builds and deployments, which let you define how you're going to build your software. Are you just going to take a Docker image off the shelf and just run it? You know, or are you going to do some special things on the way, build up you know, some more layers on top of it? So I'll go into luggage here. And I'm running a couple of things. Let's go into builds, where you can see me frantically attempting to get this thing to run. Oh, I was successful eventually. Each build gives you a log. <clears throat> Environment variables are defined in the UI. You can just create them and assign values, as many as you want, whatever your containers need. It's nice to do it at the UI. You can do it at the command line. You know, you can do it when you're building your Docker containers, but it's handy to have them just right there to, ed to edit. Also, labels. Um, labels are arbitrary. So you can label anything you want any way you want. So labels like front end, back end, testing, production, you know, testing to, special testing, whatever. Whatever way you organize your stuff, you can do it with tags. Same concept that Drupal has used historically to do great things if you just suddenly the light bulb goes on, you're like, taxonomy, it's so powerful. Yes, tags are so powerful. Okay. And then oh, I have to actually demonstrate that this is running here, right? So this is actually Drupal running on OpenShift. I just did an install. So it actually works. And then what's even more powerful is the command line client. Command line client is called OC. Lots and lots of things you can do. You can do um, OC get all. Shows everything that's running. I could do OC get pods. Show me the current status of running Docker things. One running there. A lot of the same things you can do with Docker. And in fact, this is kind of a wrapper on Kubernetes, which is a Docker management system. So all the Docker stuff is right there. Uh, you can change your project.
So there's the status of the Maria uh, pods. And I did want to say a little bit about build deployment. Browse, uh, so deployments. You can see over here, there's it's triggered on image change. So you can trigger that when you build a new Docker image. So you build a new Docker image, and it's going to take that image, and Kubernetes is going to deploy that to your clustered group. And you can say, you know, different methods of deployment. Typically, you would do like, okay, we've got three, Let's take down one. That's all we did, right? Because Kubernetes is going to go, oh, there should be three. I'll spin up a new one. I'm spinning up the new one here. And we take that's um, it's really just a matter of pushing that new build out. So what is the real? This is all great stuff, but really some of the killer stuff is in some of the projects that come along with it. There's something called source to image. And what this does is it takes your Git repository and it builds it for open channel. It's going to uh, trigger in some way. You can do it manually. You can do a web hook. You can do you know, anything you can do with Git. You can do with this. And source the image has really spent a lot of time thinking about how Docker works and what the best thing to do is. If you start working in, with Docker at the command line, you're going to be like, oh, I can have a base image. Now I can layer this on top. Oh, I want this, and this, and this, and this. And you notice, like in Tessa's example, when she had some dependencies that were building for uh, GD, there was kind of like one big line of things with lots and lots of backslashes. It's because when you're building Docker images, you have to be very careful to do the minimal amount of change to the base image that you can because that keeps your result being small. Well, these guys have really thought this through. So they have a process that I'm calling magic here that you can go read the docs with. There's a great presentation on it in uh, OpenShift Commons. If you Google for OpenShift Commons, they like a presentation every week. And uh, it's fascinating stuff. There's a 50 minute presentation on source image, which is just awesome. Uh, so basically what it does is it, it gives you a final build, which is just as small as you can get. And then you process that on into OpenShift. And it's all you know one pipeline. So this is this thing that people keep building. This is the Git repository to final production pipeline. And it's already here, and it's really awesome. So before you go out and write your own, which go ahead, because then you understand how it works and you know the nuts and bolts. Go look at what these people have done. Because this is seriously the cat's me out. Uh, so people have said, yeah. Why do we really need open shift for this? We can just do this with scripting. I love to script. Okay, those are your scripts. They're a little different than everybody else. And again, can't we just use PHP and MariaDB and little scripting? And we have Drupal? Yeah, you can. But ultimately, even though Drupal is complicated, you are better off investing the time to learn how it works and what the common conventions are, what a node is, you know, what a field is, how to use Drush. Like how to use OC, right? Same, same give powerful command line tool that does lots of great stuff. And then when you come out the other side, you're going to be a lot more powerful in this new world that we're going into, which is built on containers running on massive abstracted compute somewhere out in the cloud in virtual networks. Again, I don't necessarily like that. Because I understand virtual machines and hardware and properties. And this is all the new dragons that we have to fight in this new world. So what do you get from OpenShift? You get project management. 
You get access control, teams on this project, teams on that project. Get an awfully nice GUI. And they keep making it better. There's, there's more stuff that's in the OC client that keeps making its way into the GUI. You get a standard way of doing things. So already, there are templates that you can get for OpenShift. If you go to OpenShift, there's going to be sorry, a WordPress template. Spin up WordPress, press in one click. Looking for the Drupal template. I know uh, phase two is working on OpenShift and investigating that kind of thing. So there's at least one big uh, Drupal shop that's looking at it. Now with guys heading out. And you get community. Again, it's the same deal. You could go off into a corner and do your own thing, but you're better off learning the standard way and just coming together. And what we're going to have is the next layer of components. Right now, you need a seasoned system to put together and configure Redis, optimized MariaDB. PHP with the right INI file settings, not the defaults. All these things. We're getting to a point where it's just take these things off the shelf and put them together. And in fact, with application templates in OpenShift, you take the whole set off the shelf and be like, there's a HA Drupal. So <clears throat> I like, I know a lot of the underlying technologies. I'm not sure that it's that necessary anymore. And I know from my developers, it's a big distraction because they want to be running, writing Drupal code and solving Drupal problems, not solving problems lower down in the stack that are caused by you know esoteric uh, max packet settings or something like that. All right, so that's my presentation. I, I really encourage you to go out and look at OpenShift and I know there's alternatives, but this is worth looking at. It does a lot of the things that people want to do, and it really matches up well with my ultimate way that I'd set up a, a virtual machine environment. You said there's going to be a uh, how, how do you run into this? How do you get to know it? So, uh, what are you using? Okay. So, Red Hat has a program, I, I forget the name, it's like early adopter program or whatever, but they're obviously trying to populate their OpenShift dedicated instance with pre-built stuff. And the WordPress folks have done that. Um, you know, this is also, this is very much not PHP only. There's a lot of Tomcat, a lot of, you know, Django, things like that. So for whatever reason, Drupal has not gotten our act together and Produce one of these application template definitions. And to be honest, neither have I, right? <laughs> this, is, this is a demo. <laughs> right? I'm do I don't know it's there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still working that out. I'm still working that out. Uh, there's some problems, right? What do you do with persistent storage? It's a huge problem. Yes, uh, that, was, that was my question. What, what, you know, how do you solve that problem? What the problem is? the same problem? How do you solve that right? Yeah. So, OpenShift has the ability to use persistent storage exported uh, and at best it's the default. That's, that's what we have in the Red Hat Managed Cluster. You can also use Gluster or one of the other sort of high availability alternatives. Uh, again, you make a, a persistent storage claim when you develop your application. And this is sort of trouble for us because our current model is we run 100 and some sites, and we run them on a virtual machine with virtual storage. And if I need more storage, it's just, you know, clicky clicky, more storage. Here, I've got to make a decision up front: Am I either going to run 100 and some pods and allocate each one of those a little chunk of storage? We're thinking that multi-site is starting to look very attractive because that would mean one pod and one chunk of storage that we could then use subdirectories and permissions to just sort of hammer that. Well, S3 is another solution. 
again, with uh, just for demo purposes, I've got MariaDB running up here, but we're probably going to be using RDS instead. It's outside the cluster, but it gives you free snapshots, you know, multi availability zones if you're willing to pay for it. So it's new questions like that. It's not just connected to the database server. Willing to entertain <laughs> suggestions from people who have done that, that kind of thing before. The story said we will have to be announced to make that. So, what did databases do to solve that 30 years ago? They, they found a model where you might allocate X amount of storage and then you say, oh, and if I get up to 90% utilization of that, then I'll allocate 20% more. I mean, yep. we, we know how these old models work, and they'll end up with something like that. It's just a red, yep. I guess. And again, I mean, OpenShift and Kubernetes have very rich APIs because everything is cloudy now. Everything's got APIs for everything. So I'm sure there's a way to trigger something. That, but there's nothing that I'm aware of that's off the shelf. I think you are scared. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure there are people thinking about that. Uh, part in. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, really, because you could. You actually could do that. I mean, script with part of it is going to make me really nervous. Isn't that? No. Oh, but in a tingly way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this could really hurt. <laughs> So, how many of you are are in the cloud versus traditional sort of virtual machines? Both. Oh. Stay wild, oh. try to affect the transition, but it'll take them 10 years. But you know, it's a big place with hundreds of websites. Plenty of reasons not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I should mention that Pantheon is one of the ones that was very early to this game, they were on containers. From the beginning, they've done a lot of work. Um, unfortunately, I believe that their solution to the uh, persistent storage problem is still proprietary. So, say. They wrote their own script. <laughs> well, David Strauss is one of the smarter they, people around. They just can't be published yet. <laughs> yeah, so we're. we're Dipping our toe in the water. But the way I read things, it's coming. You can say it's already coming. Yes, and we're not important. <laughs> no, it really has. You know, by the time it's filtered down to us and us having this conversation, that's the clue. It already happened. It just hasn't been done yet. Well, some of these things are flashes in the pan, and others are real paradigm shifts. There, there are too many. There are too, too many CFOs saying, "Hey, <laughs> I'm starting to get this." Yes. People starting to treat containers like virtual machines or virtual machines like containers? I assume they ended up with average creation, so people started just having huge swarms of virtual machines done on websites, which could be like treating like more of like virtual machines. Yeah, I mean, one of the big arguments for containers is density. Right? You can get, I don't know. Probably a couple hundred virtual machines on a good server, but you can get thousands and thousands of containers on the same server. Yeah, it's more efficient, but like, people 
most people don't run their own bridge or their own parkway. They get from Amazon. <laughs> Amazon has got some limited virtual machines that they're willing to sell you at a better rate. Which means that it's similar to the lot of the machines. I mean, the things that we want have not changed, right? We want ease of use. We don't want to have some arcane command that we're going to type up. We want high availability. We don't want to have to worry about being called in the middle of the night as the drive is We want the ability to put services together without having to do a lot of configuration. So I think we're still figuring it out. The answers are just a little different between virtual machines and containers. I happen to think they're a little easier with virtual machines because they don't have the limitations that containers have. The wrong thing to do is to treat a container like a virtual machine and build a monolithic, you know, container that's got a virtual machine inside of it. But really what we're doing is the other way, right? We're building huge virtual machines with all sorts of cron and background and processes running to check if there's any mail in the spool. And we're just running Apache on it. Seems like S3 is a natural solution to the bottom of the problem. Actually, Amazon has a new um, a new service. Anybody know what it's called? It's, uh, it's not EDS. It's something like that. What does it do? It lets you mount a file system instead of interfacing with an S3 API, which Drupal really <clears throat> wants to do that. It likes to write the file system. Actually, one of the big problems with Drupal moving into the new <laughs> paradigm is that it kind of wants a file system someplace. And a lot of work has been put into faking it out and saying, it's a file system, really. <laughs> <laughs> I 